Okay, I'm going to start now. So first, following David's lead, let me introduce myself. My name is Peter. If you have a problem and you can't find David, you can come talk to me. I will help you find David. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so I will be giving three lectures, and the goal of these lectures will be to... I guess extend some of the things uh, Delano was talking about to more general case. And we'll, I guess we'll see how general can we get. So the, most, the main direction of this generalization will be to uh, essentially mostly go from scalars to more most general local operators. You should have some Lorentz indices and you don't have to be scalar. So of course this is still not the most general thing you can bootstrap because you can consider other things besides local operators like informal so it's just there about twenty five people still covered. Yeah. Twenty five yeah. people. That's a very precise Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Matt, you're late. Let's wait for people to sit down. Okay, oh, almost okay. All right, um, so for those of you who arrived later, my name is Peter, and I will not repeat the joke that I made while you were gone. Um, so as I started talking, the goal of these lectures will be to take stuff that 
some of the stuff that Delman was talking about and extend it to more general situations. And the most important direction of this generalization will be to go from scalar operators to most general local operators. And uh, this is not the most general thing you might imagine bootstrapping in a sense, because besides local operators, there of course are um, other things like conformal defects, for example. And uh, also I will not be completely general even about local operators in the sense that I will not consider supersymmetry. And I will also ignore global symmetry, so although global symmetry is so easy to incorporate. Uh, so that is an exercise for you to add global symmetries to everything I will be talking about. Um, so the tentative plan, we'll see how it goes, is in the first lecture I will talk about um, correlation functions of general local operators. Um, then this will be the first lecture. In the second lecture, we'll talk about general conformal blocks for four-point functions. And in the third lecture, if we still have time, we'll talk about uh, numerics and maybe some results. Okay, uh, can you see when I write like this? Yes, kind of, but not quite. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'll try to write a little bit larger. So, before, well, before talking about correlation functions, let me uh, take a brief but boring detour and talk about this index A I wrote on the local operator, in other words, about representation theory of uh, Lorentz group. So let's do that. And we will mostly imagine working in Euclidean. And I will also try to be a little bit careful about distinguishing spin and SO, but don't pay too much attention to that. Um, so there are two essentially different cases. Not essentially, they're very similar, but some d details are different depending on whether dimension is even or dimension is odd. And now, of course, there essentially is only one interesting case in the even dimension, only one interesting case in the odd dimension, because physics happens in three and four dimensions, as we know. Uh, but just in case some people here are interested in higher dimensions, I will make a more general discussion. Uh, so we usually draw these diagrams for, which are called the Dinkin diagrams for these groups. And I will not need to know anything about them except that uh, they have nodes. The number of nodes is equal to this number n, which is called the rank of the group. And uh, all finite dimensional representations of the group are specified by, are classified by integers, by non negative integers assigned to each of the nodes. So we'll call them lambda 1, lambda 2. Um, in general, I can have more of these nodes, and then I'll have lambda. Minus one, lambda n, and here it's lambda one, lambda two, dot dot dot, lambda n. <coughs> so in both cases, uh, these integers, which are called the Dinkin labels, are, as I said, non-negative integers, and the set of all possible combinations of these Dinkin labels gives you the set of all possible reducible representations of this group spin D. Um, so it will be useful to do a different parameterization. Instead of using Dinkin labels, I will use something which is more similar to 
uh, Young diagrams, we should integers we shall call mi, which should defined in the following way. down to m n minus 1, which is lambda n minus 1 plus lambda over 2. And then finally, m n is the n minus 1 minus lambda n. So this is for even dimensional case and for odd dimensional case, it's very similar. So here I only divide this special nodes by two. And I hope the pattern is clear that for mi you start summing from lambda i and there are only interesting cases mn in even dimensions where you have to take the difference. Now the reason why this is nice is that, well first of all, <coughs> Since all lambdas are non-negative integers, the thing that you have, the conditions on mi are that m1 is greater or equal to m2, greater or equal to m3, and so on, uh, greater or equal to m minus 1, which is greater or equal to absolute value of mn, which is, of course, non-negative. And an extra condition that is that in the odd, uh, mn is also non-negative. Besides that, we have two options. Either mi are all integers or are all half integers. So in the first case, when all mi are integers, these numbers actually describe the lengths of the rows in a Young diagram. So we can draw pictures like this. I don't know. Where the length of the first row is m1, the length of the second row is m2, and so on. And in this case, the corresponding representation is a tensor is indices running from mu1 to mu sum of all mi. And uh, this diagram tells you, so each index corresponds to a box in a diagram, and the diagram tells you how to symmetrize these indices. So you, you first want to symmetrize all the columns, and then you symmetrize all the rows, and you subtract traces, and you get an irreducible representation. I'll not talk about this in detail, but just to, uh, this is just to say that all representations with integer mi are tensor representations. And uh, then mi correspond to Young diagrams. One subtle thing is that, say, if you consider this diagram, which has n, um, n rows, and each row has only one box in even dimensions, there are two of those because this is essentially corresponds to m1 equal m2 equal mn equal 1. But in even dimension, you can also set mn equals to minus 1. And uh, sine of mn simply determines the uh, self-duality or anti-self-duality anti conditions. For example, in 4D, n is 2, so you have a two-form, and two forms in four dimensions can be self-dual or anti-self-dual. And this is determined by the uh, sign of mn. So are there any questions about this description of all possible tensor representations? Do you have any recommendation for a good reference for this? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, we can try to talk about this later. I might have, but I don't remember. Um, OK, so. Um, 
Yeah, so this describes tensor representations, which are also all representations which are bosonic in the sense that they are representations not just of spin D, but also of SOD. Now, if all these numbers are half integers, then you get spinner representations, fermionic representations, and let me just mention that uh, that uh, if all mi are equal to one half, you get the spinner representation. And uh, if, uh, and again, this in even dimensions mn, sine of mn, whether it's plus one half or minus one half, simply determines the chirality of your spinner. Okay, so one last thing I want to mention about representation theory is the relation between is how you reduce your representations from um, from spin d to spin d minus one and so on. so this is reduction this thing is weird So there are two cases. One first case is uh, going from spin uh, to n plus one to spin n, sorry, to n. <coughs> and let's say we have a representation of this group which is described by integers mi, and we have a representation of this group which is described by integers li, which are the same things as mi, but they just call them differently. So then the statement is that um, uh, the statement is that this irreducible representation decomposes into a direct sum of representations of the smaller group, and each representation appears with multiplicity one. Uh, every every representation which appears appears as multiplicity one, but not of course all representations appear. So all multiplicities are zero or one. And, uh, and the rule, for, so I, now I told you that all representations have multiplicity zero or one, and I, now I need to tell you which have zero and which have one. So the representations which have multiplicity one are those which satisfy the following inequalities. Um, so mi are fixed. This is the representation that we are reducing. And all li we get to choose, so this is these are the representations which will appear, and those which appear to re reiterate they appear as a multiplicity one. So for going from uh, spin two n to spin two n minus one, it's only a little bit different, and the reason is that in this case we had n mi's and n li's. In this case, we will have uh, uh, n minus one li, and the inequalities will be that um, like this. So it's essentially the same thing, just like a little bit different at the end. And the reason uh, I'm talking about this is because this kind of reduction will play an important role in what follows. And to just give an example, uh, let's say we take a traceless symmetric representation, which is has this kind of Young diagram with uh, J boxes, and it is 
essentially the representation of tensors in one in J, which is symmetric in the synthesis and is also traceless, and ask how does it reduce to one dimension lower. So um, the integers mi for this are m1 equals j, m2 equals m3 equals dot 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 equals zero. So if you plug this in here, doesn't matter in which one, you'll see that all L2 and so on are zero and L1 is just less or equal to M1. So um, this thing reduces to the same kind of representation as J boxes in D minus one plus is J minus one boxes plus dot 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 and it adds up as a vector and uh, a scalar and scalar I'll just denote by a dot. Um, so yeah, one thing I forgot to mention is that this integers, so this numbers Li have to be either integer or half integer depending on whether Mi were integer or half integer. So bosonic representations reduce to bosonic and fermionic to fermionic. Um, so in this example, you can see that there is a scalar and traceless symmetric tensor, and then you can ask what other representations can reduce to a scalar. And from this rule, again, you can immediately see that only traceless symmetric tensors reduce to scalars, because if you set now L1, L2 equals zero, like all Li's equals zero, then you see that all M2, M3, and so on is zero, and only M1 can be a non-negative integer. So that's an important message that only traceless symmetric tensors reduce to scalars. Are there any questions at this point? Yes? Uh, am I somehow related to the uh, coefficient in the orthonormal basis? <sighs> what is the orthonormal basis? Well, Um, they, mi they might, but I'm not sure. Um, I don't remember on the top of my head, sorry. Any other questions? Yeah. The, the fact that log cities are most one is valid in both? Uh, in both cases, yes. It is also valid, the same kind of rules also valid for SUN. If you're interested, it's not valid for symplectic groups. Um, yeah, I might also mention that this fact that multiplicity is zero one give you a very nice way to just write down basis for these representations, but I will not talk about this. Um, okay, so this ends the detour in representation theory. I just wanted to make sure that we all sort of have the same idea of what kind of representations there are. And uh, now let we start talking about correlation functions. So uh, let's consider correlation function of local operators. And when I say correlation function, I mean Euclidean correlation functions, which uh, is the kind of thing that Delman was talking about. And uh, the Lorenzian out of time ordered correlators and time ordered correlators and everything which you normally would consider are just analytic continuations of these functions. So everything that I'll be doing now is in Euclidean, but by analytic continuation, you can go to Lorenzian signature. Uh, in Lorenzian signature, you could also ask about more general conformally invariant objects which are not, conformally invariant expressions which are not necessarily uh, coming from correlation functions and their classification will be more complicated. So we will not do that, we'll just stick to this thing. Uh, okay, so there is a bunch of constraints that these correlation functions have to satisfy just from uh, general principles, so we have 
conformal symmetry that's one thing then uh, another constraint is that if there happen to be identical operators in this correlation function then it's a non-trivial requirement that it has to be permutation symmetric Furthermore, some of the operators here can be in short representations and for physical, for physically interesting theories, short representations essentially mean, uh, unless you're in a free theory, essentially mean conserved currents. So there can be some conservation constraints that this correlation function has to satisfy. In other words, uh, word identities. And then, uh, finally, this is essentially the last constraint is that it has to be analytic in Euclidean signature. Uh, there is something which I don't want to talk about, which is related to the fact that there are some reality constraints on this. Basically, if you take complex conjugation of this function, you can relate it to uh, reflected if you take complex conjugation of this uh, endpoint function, you can relate it to a reflected endpoint function and uh, figure out what this implies in terms of certain quantities being real. And I will not spend time on, on, on that. So I will try to talk about these three things today uh, in some length, depending on how much time we have. And this will probably appear in lecture three <coughs> if we will have time. Now, the general solution of uh, constraints of conformal symmetry for all correlation functions is that you can expand it in some basis of solutions to this conformal symmetry requirement, which and I will denote basis elements in the same way as I denote the correlation function. But I will put an index here which just labels the solution times some functions of conformal cross ratios. So G here also has an index A. Uh, G here is a function of all coordinates which is just simply conformally invariant in the same way as U and V are conformally invariant. And the reason why we can have these functions is because if we solved uh, con con constraints of conformal invariance on some uh, endpoint function, you can just multiply it by a bunch of cross ratios and it will still solve uh, constraints of conformal invariance. And another way of saying this is that um, solution of con conformal constra invariance constraint, uh, solutions of conformal invariance constraints form some vector space or field or ring of uh, such functions which are invariant uh, functions of cross ratios. And basically what we will try to do is we will try to understand what is the what is the space, what is this basis, how to write it down, and so on. And then we will also discuss how these other two constraints uh, show up in this discussion. Questions? Okay. So, uh, two things that we want to ask about this space is what the space is, what's its dimension, how many tensors. Yes, so let, let me just some notational thing. I will call these objects here tensor, tensor structures, which is structures. Uh, this is just kind of some language that we'll be using. And uh, the basic questions that we can ask are what is the space of these tensor structures, how many there are, and finally how to write them down. So I will probably mostly focus today on, depending on how time goes again, uh, on what the space is and how to, what is the dimension and so on, instead of writing 
explicit basis elements down uh, because the way you want to write the basis elements down highly depends on what type of operators you're studying and I will not be able to cover all possible formalisms which people use but of course I will try to get to this point as well. Okay, so let us start slowly. So let us start with one-point functions. It's kind of trivial, but it sort of, I think, illustrates the point in a good way. So we consider one-point function of some local operator. And by translational invariance, we can relate this one-point function to just one point function when the operator is inserted at zero. So the point here is that as soon as we know the one point function at zero, we know it at all other points. And then the value, so we can specify any value here and this will solve the constraints of translation invariance. But this value at zero has to be invariant under symmetries which fix zero. And those symmetries are uh, special conformal transformations dilatations and uh, uh, rotations. Now, special conformal transformations do not, give, do not give you any constraints because they simply annihilate operators at inserted at zero. Dilatations tell you that scaling dimension of the operator has to be zero, and rotations tell you that the representation of this operator has to be scalar. And this implies that the operator must be simply proportional to identity. So it's not interesting. But the general way we arrive at this result also works for higher point functions, which is why I wanted to uh, stress it. So let's now consider two-point functions. Uh, yeah, here when I said that implies that operator is proportional to one, I mean that only operators which are proportional to one can have one-point functions, not that all operators are proportional to one, of course. Uh, so consider two-point function. And we use the same logic, except that now it's not sufficient to use translational invariance, but by using combination of conformal transformation, we can compute this value at any x1 and x2 from a single value of this two-point function at some fixed positions, which we can choose to be some where the vector e, let's say, is is the unit vector in the last coordinate interaction. And now, the, if we specify this value for all indices alpha 1 and alpha 2, then we can compute what these values are. So the only thing we need to make sure is that this value is invariant under the conformal transformations which preserve this configuration. So the, the, this uh, conformal transformations which preserve this configuration form a group, and I will refer to this as the stabilizer group. So in this case, the stabilizer is uh, S1, comma 1 times spin D. And uh, instead of writing down explicit expressions for this generator, so you preserve this configuration, let me just draw some pictures. So we have two points. And uh, so there is a line which goes through them. And the, the generator, so SO1, comma 1 is simply a one-dimensional abelian group. So the generator of this group acts in the following way. It kind of moves points on these trajectories, which are just circles, which I cannot draw, but And 
the, this generator is in fact just the D that Delano was talking about in his lectures, which is not the same D as I mean, because from, for me, D will be the rotation. Um, so, but in the neighborhood of these points, this looks like a dilatation going like zooming out. This looks like a dilatation zooming in. And so actually this generator is just proportional to delta one minus delta two. So the photo point function for this thing, so essentially just multiplies this value by this difference. So for this value to be invariant under this part of the stabilizer, this has to be zero, which implies that the only way you can write an invariant is if delta one equals delta two. Now, uh, the, the spin D generators D generators act in the following way. So I to told you about this part, now we can tell this part. So again, there is obviously a spin D minus one which rotates around this line, but then there is also gen there are also generators which act roughly like this. together with uh, spin D minus one, they form a spin D. So this line here, which I drew, it can go in all the directions which are orthogonal to this line, which provides sufficiently many generators for you to have spin D group. Uh, the important point here is that spin D, spin D minus one rotates both operators in the same way, but these generators, which do this, uh, they act as M say D mu on this guy, but, they act, but on this guy they act as minus M D mu because they rotate in opposite directions. So if you have a representation given by these generators on this guy, which is row one, then these gen generators um, do not give you row two. Instead, they give you something which is called the reflection at least which I will call reflection of representation row two. And this reflection operation is defined precisely as I said. You take the general, so you start with some representation which has its representation matrices and then you just replace the matrices which have index D by minus this matrices and you can check that these matrices satisfy the same commutation relations. So this, this operation on the uh, irreducible representations. So this R, it basically sends MN to minus MN. So it only acts non-trivially in even dimensions. And in even dimensions, it just it changes the chirality of your representation. So the point of the discussion is that under this spin D, things which look like this transform in row one tensor, row two reflected. And the thing that you want is you want something which is invariant. So you want to find a trivial representation here. So a general theorem is that if you have tensor products of two irreducible representations, then they can only have contain a singlet if they're dual to each other. So row one must be equal to row two reflected dual. And so dual is dual in the sense of vector spaces, but in Euclidean signature, it's also the same as complex conjugation. And it is a simple exercise to show that this combination reflection plus dual is the same as taking complex conjugation in Lorentzian signature. So you can vic rotate this matrices to Lorentzian signature and uh, uh, their complex conjugation will act precisely in the same way. So this is natural because in Lorentzian signature, you want to be able to consider two-point functions of uh, 
this form. So I just denote uh, complex conjugation Lorentzian signature by a dagger. So in Lorentzian signature, you want to consider two-point functions of this form, which just compute you uh, the norm of the state created by y acting on, on vacuum. So if you want the states to be, have non-zero norm, you better have non-zero two-point functions of this form, which is why you, this is natural. So and if this condition is satisfied, then there is precisely one scalar in this tensor product. So to summarize, the two-point function is non-zero only if the dimensions are equal, and the representations satisfy this condition, and then there is a unique two-point structure. Are there any questions about two-point functions? Could you say again what the action of R was on the matrices? So when you suppose you have a representation rho, so it comes with some representation matrices menu, which uh, satisfy commutation relations of uh, Lorentz group. Now the point is that you t from this matrices you construct new matrices, um, let's say R menu, which are equal to uh, M menu if uh, new and new are not D or any other index number, and then they equal to minus this if uh, new or new is D. And then you can check that this matrix satisfy the same commutation relation, so they give you a new representation. And it's reflected because it's precisely like how stuff in the mirror would transform. Okay, other questions? Yes. Does this analysis give you the position dependence? Y y yes. Uh, as, like th th this is constructive in the sense that you can specify this thing, which is just the, the scalar in the tensor product. So you specify this as a fu function of alpha one and alpha two, and then if you want to compute what this is, you just use a conformal transformation to relate them together. So it's kind of implicit, but it's important that this does give you uh, the full two-point function. If you like, in the sense that it gives you a recipe to compute two-point function in any configuration. Just that this recipe is not an explicit formula. Okay, um, so let's move on to higher point functions, which are going to be somewhat simpler. Okay, so let's start with three-point functions, consider them separately, and then we'll just consider four and higher point functions at the same time. So three-point functions. Um, so again, we have this. And we again can use conformal symmetry to obtain any such three-point function from some fixed configuration. So we can start from, say, configuration which is similar to what we just considered. So now we have uh, three points, again on the line. So this is zero, this is, uh, this vector is minus E, and this vector is uh, plus E. And the stabilizer group in this case is uh, just spin D minus one, which rotates uh, around this line. And uh, it simply rotates all the three points in the same way, which implies that this thing under this stabilizer group transforms as simply tensor products of tensor product of these three representations. And since it has to be invariant under the stabilizer, we need to pick a value which is belongs to invariant subspace under spin d minus one. 
So the space of allowed values for this configuration is just this space, which is the tensor product of three representations, and you take the subspace which is invariant under this smaller subgroup. And this also is why I talked about these reduction rules, because uh, say if you're interested in five, dim five dimensions, I don't know how to take tensor products in five dimensional uh, in spin five, but I know how to take tensor products in spin four because it's just a C2 times a C2. And instead of taking this tensor product in spin five, you can first reduce to spin D minus one, which I told you how to do, and then do the calculation in spin four. Um, okay, so another rule which is also can be found in the literature is that uh, the three-point tensor structures are in one-to-one -one correspondence with trace symmetric tensors which appear in this tensor product, which is the same statement because as I just explained before, only trace symmetric tensors reduce to scalars and each trace symmetric, traceless symmetric tensor reduces to precisely one scalar under spin d minus one. Okay, uh, are there any questions about three-point functions? Cool. Yeah, like this for two-point functions? Yeah, you can sort of imagine this all happening on the sphere, and then you can imagine that this is south pole and this is north pole. And then under a graphic, pr I mean, it's okay. For two point functions, the simplest way is to just go to configuration where one point is inserted at zero and other point is inserted at infinity. Then this is so one comma one is simply generated by dilatations and the point at infinity and the spin d's are generated by rotations. But then that configuration is kind of hard, less obvious to see that the, the, this really just rotate, rotated in opposite directions. Um, okay, so this is the three-point functions, and let me let me go to higher-point functions. I guess by now, definitely, I mean, probably by the time of two-point functions, but now everybody understands where it's going. Um, so we can again choose some standard configuration. And let me choose this configuration where, so let me, let's consider first four-point function. So we can again put three points on uh, a line. Let's see, one, two, three. And uh, after that, we still have this spin d minus one, which rotates around it. And we can use the spin d minus one to select a plane and put point number four somewhere in this plane. And after that, we cannot do anything to point number four. It can be anywhere in the plane. And the, st the stabilizer group for this configuration is the thing which I cannot draw where it rotates anymore because I can only the projections of three-dimensional space, but this is spin d minus two, which is rotate, which is the group which rotates in directions which are orthogonal to this plane. And then, if you have say five point function, what you do is you repeat this for the first four points, and you still have spin d minus two. Uh, to move around the fifth point, and you can use it to put the fifth point in a particular three-dimensional subspace. So I only have one three-dimensional subspace, so it doesn't look kind of arbitrary, but you can choose any thing. And this will be point number five. So in point, and after you've done that, you cannot do anything more to point number five. It will just be anywhere in this three-dimensional space, and so on for higher point functions. And for five-point function, you get the stabilizer group is spin d minus three, and so on. 
So since we cannot put for po point number four to uh, where we like in the plane, if we start with some particular endpoint function and try to compute its value by going to this standard type of configuration, we don't know where point four will land. And this means that we have uh, to specify this four point function for point four anywhere in the plane. There are two coordinates for point for point four in the plane, which is related to this leads to this fact that there are two conformally invariant cross ratios, which as David, I think, said, must be written in every bootstrap lecture, so I will do that. I will also write them down in my next lecture and the one after that. <laughs> and this is one exchange, it's three. And this probably was already said. This is the square root of u. This is square root of v. Um, like not precisely, so this will be the case if this will be labeled a little differently. And point four will be at infinity. Um, cool. So all the points under the stabilizer groups rotate in the same way. So we get that the value for each of these configurations, so for each value of u and v, or z in z bar, whatever cross ratios you would like, same as for the five point function, the value that you need to specify has to be invariant under the stabilizer group. So under the stabilizer group, every point transforms in the same way, so you get a tensor product of all representations, and you need to take it to spin uh, d plus two minus m, where m is a minimum of n and d plus two. So essentially M is like N, but if you have too many points, then you run out of uh, degrees of freedom that you can fix, essentially, like you get to trivial groups at some point. For example, in three dimensions, like you, you cannot do anything to the point five, it has to be anywhere to point six and so on, you cannot do anything, they are just somewhere, and there is no, there are no stabilizer groups with negative in arguments, basically. So this is, uh, this gives you the space of uh, endpoint tensor structures. And let me just uh, write a formula that the number of u and v's in the uh, general case is m times m, m minus three over two plus d times m minus m. And the way to get this is you just see that four point, four point function you have two, for point number four, you have two degrees of freedom. For point five, you have three. For point six, you have four, and so on. But then it cuts off with the dimension of your space. And so at some point, starting, starting from d plus two points, you just get uh, that every point adds d degree, d cross ratios. Okay. Uh, after. After, okay, let me do an example in three dimensions and four point functions and that will answer your question. You're asking in the case when there are too many points. Well, that's so in general case, this is just this thing, it's dimension of the space. You take tensor product, you look for stuff which is invariant under this smaller subgroup. If this group is trivial, then everything in this tensor product gives you a tensor structure. So for example, which is I'm, where I'm going now. It's the, the, a very relevant case of three dimensions. This becomes completely trivial for four point functions. So four point functions in 3D. This rule tells us that we need to take row one, tensor row two, tensor row three, tensor row four. And we need to find invariance under spin one. So spin one just tells you that the t tensor product, spin one is just essentially contains a trivial element and minus one to the f. So 
it essentially tells you that the tensor product of four representations has to be bosonic because of this is like a separate selection rule. And uh, then it just tells you that anything in the tensor product is a good tensor structure. So for example, three dimensional representations are labeled by integer uh, half integer j i. So you can find that the dimension of the space is just uh, 2j i plus 1 product of all points. So this is a number of four-point tensor structures in uh, three dimensions without any additional constraints yet. Let me also mention about 3D that say if you want, so far I have been ignoring the question of parity and variance, but if you have, uh, if you want to consider space parity, then instead of spin groups, you need to consider um, pin groups, let's say, or for simplicity, let us think about uh, bosonic representations and then we can replace spin by SO. And if you have parity, you just consider O. So O1 is non-trivial. It is Z2, and it contains a reflection. And the way this reflection acts is that you have this plane in which you have your four points, and reflection simply reflects with respect to this plane. So in this case, it gives you a less, uh, a little bit more, so in 4D, so in 3D, this gives you a little more uh, refined counting of this thing, which for bosonic representation splits this into, so let me call this N4. So N plus four will be N4 plus one over two, and minus four will be N4 minus one over two where this is a number of parity even structures and this is a number of parity odd structures. And let me say that if you have a global symmetry, essentially the thing that you need to do is you uh, consider a row as having global symmetry, also being representation of global symmetry and you look for invariance under the global symmetry group times the stabilizer group, so. So N4 is the dimension of the, this four tensor product representation. Yeah. But the A is the, the, the structure index has to do with the number of irreps that appear in the tensor product, right? When you decompose again. Or Sorry, uh, which index A? The uh, index of yeah, the, the tensor structure? Number of structure, yeah. No, this is just the number of structures dimension of this space. Uh, are you referring to the this thing that I said here about tens like traceless symmetric tensors which appear in this decomposition. I, I thought you would have to take this tensor product and decompose into spin D irreps and then count the number of those or no? No, that's n oh, not. Oh, you have to decompose under the stabilizer. Yes. Oh. And you need to count the number of singlets under the stabilizer, not okay. all the reps. Because the point is that you're trying to construct something which is invariant under the okay. stabilizer. So uh, before moving on, let me briefly also get back to this case with uh, uh, three-point functions. Just consider the example when row one and row two are scalars. Then you, you're looking at invariant as, at spin d minus one invariance of uh, inside row three. And as we discussed on the traceless symmetric tensors, well, I already erased that, but on the traceless symmetric tensors give you scalars under this reduction. So row three has to be a trace symmetric tensor and this is a standard result that only trace symmetric tensors appear in OP of two scalars. Okay, in the remaining time, let me quickly discuss uh, permutation symmetries. And the permutation symmetries are interesting in the case when uh, you have identical operators in your correlation function. And uh, the interesting cases to consider are actually only three-point functions and four-point functions. So for three-point function, you just have an explicit expression, uh, which doesn't have, for each tensor structure, you have an explicit expression. In principle, if you write it down, which doesn't have any cross ratios and you can permute points and you can demand that this expression is invariant under this permutation. Uh, but for higher point functions, you get this cross ratios, 
And the cross ratios in general are not invariant under uh, permutations. So if you take a generic permutation of points and you apply it to a cross ratio, it will change. So for example, if you t as written there, if you uh, permute points one and three, then cross ratios one and u and v will exchange. And this is a crossing symmetry. So it's not really a statement of, uh, it's not really a statement about tensor structure, it's more a statement about the function of cross ratios which multiplies to tensor structure. And the only interesting permutations that you can consider are the uh, permutations which actually preserve tensor structures. And it is easy to show that such permutations, sorry, permutations which preserve cross ratios. It is easy to show that such permutations only exist for th three point functions, like for two, three, and four point functions. For two, three po point functions, it's trivial because uh, you don't have any cross ratios. For four point functions, you can check. I will discuss which permutations fix these cross ratios. Then you can show that for five point functions and be beyond that, there is no, uh, there are no permutations which fix all the cross ratios. Um, okay, let me first go to three point functions and uh, then I'll talk about this issue when I switch to four point functions. You can do that, but that's not the most general. I mean, wh wh why would your theory have such a function? Um, uh, because the thing, the, the five-point function needs to be invariant under permutation, so it must be some function of cross ratios that is invariant. Yeah, yeah, there is a function of cross ratios which is invariant under these permutations, and you can study that, but this is not the question of the tensor structures which multiply it. It's just a statement, like, if you decompose it in confirm blocks, this will give you crossing equations, but this is not something which is, has to be satisfied at the level of tensor structures. It's something which has to be satisfied at the level of functions which multiply these tensor structures. I mean, I'm not saying that these permutations are completely useless, it's just that that's not what I want to talk about now. Uh, okay, so let me start with three-point functions and uh, to see how permutations work for three-point functions. It's useful to reinterpret this construction a little bit. Since you talk so much about five-point functions, do you think it's going to be a useful one day for the bootstrap? No, I didn't talk about them at all. <laughs> <laughs> I just said that for higher point function there are no permutations, so I don't want to talk about them. Okay. <laughs> but they might be useful, for, but maybe for analytic bootstrap more than for numeric. Um, okay, so to, I will only consider a simple case uh, when you have two identical operators. So you have, say, O uh, alpha 1 of x1, O of 2 of x2, O3. And uh, so this is one and the same operator, and the statement is just when you write down the expression for this three-point function, it has to be invariant under permutation of x1 and x2 simultaneous with alpha 1 and alpha 2. Uh, this can be seen already. Uh, to see how this works, let me explain what be the general expression for, let me consider this configuration where I, now I don't demand that vector E is a particular fixed vector and I consider this as a function of vector E. And I will, but I will demand that vector E has unit lengths. In this case, if I write this expression as a function of E, I can perform, I can check the symmetry without having the most general expression. And the statement is that this is given by uh, some tensor. So then this is alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, mu one, mu j. And what this tensor is, to, to see what this tensor is, let me get back to this rule. So as I said, 
we are looking for singlets under spin D minus one in the triple tensor product, but this is the same as trace of symmetric tensors in this tensor product under SOD. And so this tensor here, this tensor Q, simply is the Klebsch-Gordon coefficient, which takes the representations given by alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and turns them into a trace symmetric tensor. If you have that, you can contract them with EJ. This will give you a, um, uh, something which is invariant under rotations, which is the thing that you should be worried about in this case. And if you set vector E to some particular configuration, as the one I discussed before, for example, this one, this will just set all indices to one, which is the same as just reducing the, which is just, will give you the scalar under SOD minus one that you want for this construction. And the point is that for this expression, it's very easy to check what happens under exchange of these two operators. It just gets uh, multiplied by minus one to the J because you exchange E by minus E and you permit the indices of Q. Alpha two, alpha one, alpha three. And so the statement is that uh, if J is even, let's assume that these operators are bosonic, then if J is even, you want to have stuff which is symmetric un of, uh, under exchange alpha one, alpha two, so we would be looking at S squared row one. So this is symmetric square times row three under spin D minus one. This is for J even and for J odd. You want to look at uh, the antisymmetric square. So this is the exterior square. And to see, well, so this allows you to count how many symmetric structures there are, but there is a little problem with this rule because it requires you to know which trace of symmetric tensor of spin D did you use uh, to get this invariant here. And uh, fortunately, there is a way to avoid that, which is, uh, uh, which is as follows. So the parity of J in even dimensions, so for D equals to N, J uh, mod two is just it always equal to sum over three points over the three representations, sum over I one to N, M I related for the case point. So it's, if you have bosonic representations though, J modulo two is the same as the total number of boxes in all three representations. Uh, and number of boxes is the number of indices. And the reason for that is to, if say alpha one, alpha two, alpha three are tensor representations, you would use invariant tensors of uh, SO two N to write down this Q and these invariant tensors are only delta mu nu and epsilon mu one mu d, well, mu two n, and they both have an even number of uh, indices. So the number of indices here should be the same parity as the number of indices here. And so here you can, uh, if we call this number j script, you can replace the rule by j script. So you compute this J script from the three representations that you have, and then depending on the sign, uh, on its parity, you take either this thing or this thing. J was the spin of the traceless symmetric representation which appeared in okay. this tensor product. So, so there, in this tensor product, there is a trace symmetric representation. Uh, of spin J. And we, so for each 
trace symmetric representation of the stanzer product, we can construct the Clef Gordon uh, coefficient Q and use it to build the tensor structure. Yeah. So as an example, uh, so this is the rule for even dimensions. And for dimensions, it's, uh, th th this rule is different because, uh, so the, this is the simple reason why this uh, thing has, what I said works. The more complicated reason is that, uh, and more, but more complicated but more general reason is that uh, is that this is eigenvalue, so minus one to the J script is uh, the eigenvalue of a central element of spin uh, spin D, and so it, it is additive under tensor products, or multiplicative, multiplicative under tensor products. But for tensor representations, it has very simple uh, interpretation, and for, and it's clear why it fails in odd dimensions, because in odd dimensions, epsilon symbol has odd number of indices. So this rule fails, but however, epsilon symbol is parity odd, so you can see that when the, this rule fa fails, you get a parity odd structure. So in uh, even dimension, sorry, in odd dimensions, rule is the same, uh, but you need to consider J plus parity of the structure instead of J. And if you're interested in s things like generic space-time dimension, uh, then you can just use this rule. For example, if you have uh, two identical scalars, so for scalars, O, M, I are, are equal to zero, uh, and uh, the third operator has to be traced symmetric tensor of spin J3, so then this cry J is just equal to spin of the third operator. And uh, on depending on parity of the spin. So if the spin is even, we need to consider symmetric square of the scalar representation, which is just a scalar representation. And we get back the counting that we did before for di distinct scalars. But if J3 is odd, then you have to consider exterior square. And uh, you get tr like exterior square for one dimensional representation is zero. So you don't get anything here, which implies that only even spin Trace tensors appears and appear in these products in, in the OP of the identical scalars. Uh, are there any questions? There are some exercises for like doing this boring counting, but I think it's useful to understand how many things there are before trying actually to construct them and write down. Here? Uh, there's, I expect there's more than one uh, space Yeah, they will give to structures which do not mix between each other. So this is a particular structure. Gen general correlation function, of course, will be a sum over different stuff. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that, that's what, uh, uh, do you want me to do this more explicitly? Uh, th that's what I was trying to describe. Yeah, that, that, that's precisely what you can see, but the point, uh, but, but there are much simpler ways to see that for scalars, but I think this is the simplest thing that you can have for general case. If you have, I don't know, if you want to con con consider like stress tensor, stress tensor, something else, then this is the kind of thing which is, would want to do before actually trying to construct that. So let me quickly, mention what happens is four point functions. Uh, let me get this cross ratios here. So with this cross ratios, you can notice that, let me write out V explicitly actually. So V is X13 squared X34, sorry. X14 squared X23 squared three squared x four squared. 
And you can notice that both U and V are invariant under the following group of permutations, which is, uh, is Z2 times Z2. And it is consists of trivial permutation, permutation which exchanges 1, 2, and 3, 4, permutation which exchanges 1, 3, and 2, 4, and permutation which exchanges 1, 4, and 2, 3. So it's just all the permutations of this cycle type when you have two cycles of length two. So for example, if you exchange, uh, if you look at this thing, then you have one, four, two, three, uh, this guy's a left invariant, and then this guy's just gets swapped, and you can check for u and so on. And you can also check that these are the only permutations issued with the cross hatches invariant. And by writing these formulas for higher point functions, you can check that none of them work, that there are no permutations for higher point functions which leave them invariant. Uh, okay, and the claim is that um, here it's a little more complicated because I will not be able to actually prove the rule that I'm going to state, but the idea is that after you do permutation, so here, for example, we agreed to put one here, which is zero, uh, let's say three at one, four at infinity, and two at some coordinates like u and v or z and z bar. And the problem with this is that after we say apply this permutation, one, two, three, four, let's say, then we'll get that two is at zero now, uh, one is at z z bar, uh, at one, you have now four. At infinity, you have three. So it's not the configuration of the same type. And uh, you knew the value of your four-point function in this configuration. Now you don't know it yet in this configuration. And you need to, uh, to relate them to each other. You need to apply a conformal transformation. And this kind of makes it a little bit tricky to see in this formalism, but you can work it out. and it, it turns out to give a very simple rule for what is the number of four-point functions, four-point tensor structures which are invariant under this permutation, and this is what I'll just write down. So uh, there are two cases. The first case is that there are, since, uh, since this, uh, these permutations always exchange at least two, pa two pairs of operators, so there are two cases when you have relation function O1, O1, O2, O2, or when, you, when all the operators are identical and you have just O, 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 O. In both cases, it turns out that uh, the thing that you need to do is you take the tensor product uh, as usual, and then you um, take the spin d minus two invariant subspace. But before doing that, you also uh, symmetrize under group of your permutation, which I will denote by pi kin, where kin space stands for kinematical, and kinematical is just the word that I will use to describe this kind of permutations. So these are the kinematical permutations, which do not change the uh, cross ratios. So in this first case, this rule, and this is important, and you always just symmetrize, no matter, it doesn't matter whether you have permanence or so on, you just uh, symmetrize and that's it. So in, in this case, it just means that you take S squared of L1 tensor L2 under uh, spin D minus two. And in this case, it's more complicated You're, because you have a, it's not, complete symmetrization because you're not allowed to use all permutations but only those kinematical ones. And uh, let me just write a formula for this type of symmetrization which looks a little ridiculous but this is something you can prove. So then you have just one tensor representation, 
just one representation row, you tensor it four times, you get do some reducible decomposition, and then you need to throw away some terms from that reducible decomposition, which I will denote by this formal subtraction of S squared row tensor uh, lambda squared row, and you need to do this three times. And you take invariant tensor. So it's kind of weird, but that's what you can prove it is. For the people who uh, like characters better, then the character of this representation is uh, chi 4 of g minus 3 chi squared of g squared over 4. And you can just check that the characters agree between these two cases. OK. Uh, I didn't get to talk about, do I have another five minutes? No. No? <laughs> okay. Um, let me just say without explanation very quick, quickly that the way you can take conservation into account, at least for the purposes of counting, is very simple and it amounts to, so for three-point functions and four-point functions, and so on, you always ask for invariance of groups which are smaller than spin d. And to take uh, conservation of uh, op some operators into account, what you need to do is instead of using uh, row of spin d, you use, uh, you just start flat out from the, from the representation of uh, spin d minus one. So for example, for stress tensor, you would use spin two representation of spin d minus one. Because all the other, uh, if you started with spin two of spin d and reduce it to spin d minus one, you would get spin two vector in the scalar, but vector in the scalar are essentially killed by the conservation equation. And so this is just the complete rule for counting that you, for conserved operators, you use spin d minus one representations instead of spin d representations. Uh, okay, and let me just say that for four-point functions and higher, you can use it always, and for three-point functions, you can only use it if you have at least one generic scaling dimension in a three-point function. All right, so stop here. <laughs>